Hello everyone, today we talk about courtly literature during the 12th century. It's essentially aristocratic nature. The um, feudal environment uh, of the greater monarchic centers in Europe, the general um, relation between the, the, the master, the authority, the, um, let's say the lord, and the follower, right, the, the artist, the poet, and how this relation fared across Europe, especially thanks, or among the other factors, of course, but the dynastic, right, is an overlooked aspect, uh, branching, right, of uh, this, uh, say, literary interest, musical interest, it was essentially connected with the, say, artistic expression of the warrior bard and so the the idea that actually the same rulers um, as fighters right as protectors of their community were to um, express uh, the divine harmony that they were deriving from from the holy ghost as the media of, of the same divinity as the the imperium receivers like for their military deeds throughout pr pretty much any other activity and thus emanating a sort of uh, higher like in fact um, divinely inspired set of contents also in a in a in fact artistic musical sense it is that music was uh, together with the words and all one with that phonetically connected with the harmony that laid under the entire creation. It's the same concept actually that brought to the development of the Gothic cathedrals uh, during the same period. I mean, the, the bases were uh, Neoplatonic. Um, think about uh, Dionysus, the Aeropagite, um, Augustine's De Musica. These were principally, even before architecture strictly meant Vitruvius, the actual authorities on the basis of which the cathedral as the, the example of the spiritual elevation touching um, heaven right and in, in developing in height and being constituted ideally by pure light because that's also what but differently from the Romanesque that the Gothic really does is here it absorbs light right it reflects internally the light entering from um, from the stained glass on this very white uh, or light at least um, structure that is intended to be transfiguratively um, in fact spiritual like um, elevated from the uh, let's say the sinful nature of the world this is all expressed by thinking about the gargoyles on the outside the the at least as the imperfection of the world ma manifesting um, in from at a superficial level, right? And then the core that is instead is the true uh, sea of, of the divine, right? And and when you look at 12th century literature, realize that pretty much the connection existing between the poets and the rulers was that close, not just as we'll see now, notoriously some rulers were um, composers, right? And this is a tradition that really lives on throughout the following centuries. Think about the Minnesanga, um, think about, like, all the, the military involvement, generally speaking, we tend to forget for even the, the still novel authors, etc. Um, and that, I would say, historiographically has been ten tendentially presented as, um, you know, these were just, like, I don't know, random uh, employees of the powerful guys that were just, you know, banqueting, you know, chewing some uh, pork leg, and, and these guys had just invent a culture and, and artistry because they were just, I don't know, the, the poor exploited people. This is, this is a completely um, inept, um, incorrect, false, and the extremely damaging concept of um, 12th century literary production. Right, there, were, there was a level of that kind, as we were saying before, clientelly speaking, there were tensions, in fact, ideological divides, there was to a degree, in fact, also criticism of the establishment, but 
it was also and primarily in this war the celebration of the same. I will not spend myself today in explaining parties. I made some video as about the Goliards, um, the general criticism through even through the the, the spread of the Aristotelian. Uh, philosophy in the West before scholastics, the um, of of the uh, of the establishment of the constituted order. This always existed, must exist, as a matter of fact, in order to paradoxically support the order in itself. There wouldn't be such a thing. I explained this in some more, you know, religious, mythological ways in the video about the role of the Dionysian in divine transfiguration. Um, however, um, this was in fact still part of a, so a system, of course it was modernizing, we're talking about the 12th century Renaissance to, uh, to, some, um, to some stereographical extent. The idea that of course together with this massive expansion of the of Western civilization you have also the, the expansion of certain estates and ideas and elements also especially in the 12th century, was still, especially from an ideological point of view, without many checks before the Great Repression um, of the Albigensians, of Scholastic, uh, etc., in, in the 13th, the, the, the full affirmation of the feudal order in a statal institutional sense, the one of the Catholic Orthodoxy, for that matter, as well, a, mm, let's say, a, a quite experimenting, provocative um, atmosphere that was, however, always connected with that, um, say, moral life sense of how the elite should have been tempered, right, before it would lock um, itself um, in the third quarter of the of the 12th century into something sort of more untouchable, right, in terms of social distinctions and whatever. And so what we see also uh, about the following centuries is the the consequence of the latter rather than the quite experimental and uh, and dynamic um, uh, phase before like the this also expands a, as a judgment in other fields of philosophy of science whatever today we talk mostly about like the again the, the courtly aspect the, even the entertainmental one but what this meant also in a um, especially in the relation of commission, right? Why were these works issued in the first place? What is that the rulers wanted to achieve with that? And the latter's taste, inclination and proclivity and talent even in the production and uh, participation in the same literary production. One fundamental aspect, in, even quantitatively speaking, necessary to understand the aristocratic dynamic of 12th century literature behind uh, the, this literature, say better, is the fact that it was in fact mostly directed to a privileged audience of sort, an elite one. We're talking um, bishops, monks and clerics, if in Latin, and kings, knights, but also clerics, uh, in the case of vernacular. Naturally, there were actually some laymen who knew Latin, who understood Latin, um, and that listened, like, in the, also the, the same, the opposite is true, like, the, the clergy would be exposed anyway to, to some vernacular content um, in the first place, right? But the most important fact about this, as we will see better now, is that such literary uh, production was mostly enclosed as the same as we'll see now term through bar clues actually means uh, within these specific estates right uh, literature was seen truly as something uh, holy to an extent again connected traditionally with a divine order that not everybody had the status of approaching almost an, in an initiatic um, uh, entourage, right, that was truly initiated in this way, meaning that if you look even at, I don't know, how um, the clergy or, or the knights were, were trained, they were 
just in their own different ways, like just initiated to that life. It was truly a new life with a new, with, with a new, at least identity of, of some, in some cases also a, a different name in the process that did entail an important degree of intellectual training, not just, um, say, especially thinking about, I mean, for the clergy it's obvious, but for the knights as well, right? The, what we consider, I explained this in the video about, I uh, made about the chanson de geste and the actual meaning behind that, identitally, traditionally, and, and, and imperially, I, I would say. Um, this is um, about stimulating some, eliciting some reactions that are necessary in order to build a backbone that eventually will be needed to um, to assist like in other activities. Always remember that it's quite notorious that the peak of male creativity is also the peak of male violence and that there is nothing surprising about the Minna's anger. We will see perhaps in better videos, but this other um, gen uh, gen literary uh, generous uh, authors, right, in being ruthless as systematic mass killers by profession, by vocation, and just by duty and privilege, right, and holy uh, call. And some of the single most talentedly sensitive um, in fact artistic capacity poetic capacities of sort right it is absolutely intertwined and it could have not been otherwise right so this video will not analyze the single works I have to start probably a, at some point I don't know when actually a, a true history of literature series because we did talk there is a, a playlist called if not medieval literature I think it's uh, history of art or something and I usually um, insert these videos there um, but they're mostly about a history of the say the political the social or even military background of art which is dramatically needed because uh, you m many people who study just history of art to do it by detaching it completely from actual history and this happens too often just like with philology or archaeology you think that these people are actually or should be historians they absolutely do not have any real historical training behind it it's, it's become at least empirically uh, painful to, to measure this um, uh, in the academia but it's also notorious history has probably a, a completely different um, aim and sort of uh, overarching mission and mandate um, and access, by the way, over, over this single, um, these single branches, right? Um, there are different examples. We can quote, of course, some, at least we can name some work just for understanding better um, the elite nature of this uh, of the same right? for example the Roman de Teb, one of the most famous ones we will see now the, the details about that but first and foremost states from within like the author that is anonymous points out that those were not knights or clergymen um, in other words, they did not belong to the first and the second estate, cannot take part into this mostly reading of the work, because these works were written, or initially sometimes actually the, the tradition, as you know, was all oral and learned by heart, and there was in fact a level of interiorization spiritually and identitarily that transcends what we even, in fact, we have completely lost the capacity of, of doing today when, as, as an exercise. There were people who knew the entire Bible by heart. Uh, I just I ask a person today to do so. Um, they, they just have lost the, the contextual tools to, to be able to do that, right? And never again commit the childish mistake of thinking yourself to be more intelligent or 
capable than a person living 800 years ago, right? If you do so, you're just probably one of the most abortive consequences of our um, subcult, say the, the, the lowest levels of our subcultural failures. In any case, um, the author said explicitly, and now everyone should remain silent concerning this matter unless they are clerks or knights, for no one else can appreciate it any better than a donkey appreciates harp music. Right? Um, and the parallel between the, the donkey and all those who not understand this literal work uh, sung with also harp music among the others, I made a video about at least medieval French musical instruments. This guy was from Poitou, as a matter of fact. Um, and we've seen there also what music was about traditionally. None of what we see it today like anymore, unfortunately. So there is no doubt whatsoever that these compositions were thought to be just for a specific level of people above the rest, the elite. The, hierarch the, the truly higher level of the hierarchy. In fact, the trobar clues means exactly this. Um, it, it combines the Provencal words trobar, so the, literally the, the composition of poetry, like a sort of invention, and clues, that means close, in this sense, to all the donkeys that are out there. And by the way, the Roman de Thèbes is, as you know, this um, essentially, uh, yeah, French poem by uh, this unknown author that was at least originary of Poitou. It was composed around the mid-12th century and it also inspired itself naturally to, to classical works, just like you can understand from the title. It um, uh, goes back indirectly to Statius Tebite. Um, it, it draws an inspiration uh, from, among other things, Ovid's Metamorphosis. That's also why he actually talks about the donkey among the others. But also the, the Latin Iliad, um, and it tells the legend of Oedipus. There is, they're all uh, again. We will talk about this work more in depth at some other point. But it, it sort of like it, it already represents essentially a courtly novel of some sort, and the statement is quite uh, quite evident because you understand that the environment where this could be said was not just. Uh, in the open street, even though there were some gatherings of such sort, the same nobility was um, pretty much out there, much more than we think. Um, but um, it's uh, especially the, the frequent digression and love topics, right, is very much like connected with the courtly idea of love, which is also while it's of course very double, it's very spiritual and very physical at the same time, but we tend to forget what, in fact, the spiritual side of the story was actually about and how it did necessarily connect with the physical one. Um, the angel-like woman was the the female demon of victory. It needed to be tamed and possessed to transfigure in holy combat, right? It's the same reason why, I don't know, this was thought to be contained, I don't know, in the swords, right? That were sort of the missing complementary alter ego, like tonically produced, so also feminine from, from the bowels of the earth produced. Um, that, that's the same reason why Roland is, while dying, is, you know, all enamored um, and, you know, in pain for, for having to abandon his own sword um, that he prefers to kill, to break, rather than fall into the hands of, of, the, of the Saracens, rather than his, his woman, actual woman at home, that was sort of just accessory in, in that sense. So it's actually a pretty, you know, it, that's how I was talking about before, the fact that, of course, in this literary development in the 12th century, it already reflects some level of softening up, of materialization of, of the spiritual ideals, etc., is um, is taking place because um, there is a definitely a explicitly erotic content at some at some level in some at least some of these works, uh, but the and this again is interpreted in the usually uh, you know 
socialistic, materialistic thing. Ah, oh, no, look at these guys. We're just a bunch of depraved people. There was sexual liberty everywhere. There were a bunch of... Uh, it, it should be always like that. And uh, ideals are just for, you know, right-winger maniacs. No, that that that's where actually this world meaning actually stand from. And that's the only reason why, by the way, for example, these authors would specifically speak of these... I mean, this would sing this this works as a well among this such an exclusive literally etymologically exclusive circle all right it was a form of higher training of higher cultivation for the true leaders of that world there was properly a pride and an identity entailed by this sort of literary participation composition and appreciation Right, it, it it's like what in, may, in many ways identified, especially the uh, elite. Right, something to be passed down and the generations, like as a sort of valuable uh, good that belonged, by the way, to the blood for several generations, and even more so actually um, ancestrally. Right, the techniques uh, to, of course, to compose the styles, whatever it was, something modern. Um, but the, um, the the root principle, this is often forgotten by the same historians of, of literature, had to do with that sort of wisdom that uh, these individuals had were able just by nature, genetically, to, to, to express. Right. Um, perhaps the, the best examples are uh, the ones of the House of Aquitaine that would be responsible genetically to spread literally all this uh, yeah, over the the various thrones of Europe really. and we're talking William the Knight of Aquitaine and his offspring and I give you a bit of a biography to understand what kind of profiles what kind of characters we are discussing here not just for the literary sake, because if you read this in a literature uh, literature book, it's just like I don't know. It's it's a name, and then he wrote the stuff. And what did he do in his life? Well, never mind. Well, he was William was the, the Duke of Aquitaine, as well as the Count of Auvergne and Poitiers. I made a video about uh, Aquitaine, and in, in, for the historical regional series, we can check out. He was born uh, in 1071, and he died either in 1126 or 27. He was the son of William the Eighth that had, um, like say, he had passed away when his young was uh, uh, rather young, only fifteen, ten, eighty-six. Um, so um, William took over power, uh, and the difficulties, the hardships of that, quite early on. And ten years later, taking advantage of the absence of Raymond, the Count of Toulouse, who had left for the first crusade, William took possession of his title and then of his state, right? This usurpation lasted actually a short time, as we've seen also in the video for, uh, about the county of Toulouse, um, given that uh, Raymond's son, Bertrand, and his allies, um, you know, just pushed William back. We are in 1100. William then left with his army in turn for the Holy Land, in part to atone for his sins, and so this also imperial failure, say failure, display of divine um, favor. Uh, yet he lost all his men um, and had to take refuge in Antioch. Returning to France in 1114, William again took over the county of Toulouse, which he managed to retain this time until 1120. So something had worked um, in terms of deal with, with God. Um, in the in the Holy Land, uh, William also fought against the Moors in Spain, right? Because, as we've seen in the videos about the Reconquista, it was really normal for um, Frankish noblemen to go out there, for, you know, Occitanian here, properly Aquitanian ones, to go fighting, in fact, in, in the close of Spain. He also fought, however, for properly the, the French against the Germans on the borders of Champagne, and William is also known as we point out today, for his uh, refined poetry. He was a troubadour himself, 
um, in uh, Provencal, right? And actually, little evidence remains uh, of the poetic activity of William because the compositions that can rightly be attributed to him amount to only 11. But again, for a guy born in the late 11th century, it's not that bad, considering that he was also a bit like the beginner of this whole trend, right? Uh, Occitania was, say, uh, stereotypically, culturally felt to be like the uh, a hot-blooded country, quite sensual one, like opposed to the rigid, colder uh, French north, like the south, florid, sort of feminine, loaded, the, the icon of Eleanor of the same house here of Aquitaine would make that, we will, as we will see now, bringing also this, in fact, um, courtly love poems uh, out there. Um, uh, in any case, going back to William the Ninth, there is no doubt that his poems were more numerous than the ones that we have. Um, the the chronicler uh, Ordericus Vitalis, that died around 1145, left us memories of certain rhythmic verses that William composed after his return from Jerusalem, by which uh, surely he, he had been inspired. And then because William of Malmesbury, an important author of the 12th century, tells us stories about him which seem to, to be misunderstandings of some of his lost lyrics, um, at least considered that this world starts being part of the, the broader Angevin um, empire uh, quite soon, so that there is a, a deep connection also with the Arthurian legion from Britain, uh, all the, um, uh, again, all the, 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 the type of, the, the, the most feudal and chivalric type of epos that echoed from like Germanic, Celtic times. Um, and um, the, the, such is the story of the foundation of uh, near, on the model of the Cistercian monasteries, right, of, a, of an abbey of prostitutes, right, which is the narrative regarding the painting, painted also on um, William's shield of the portrait of a viscontess that would have been his concubine, right, and this had a lot to do with that sense of angel slash devil woman that basically the hero has to transfigure from like, the most in fact, feminine, uh, telluric, um, uh, Dionysian sort of, um, in fact, terrestrial, uh, fertile dimension, the, the, the more fruitful, the, the spiritual transfiguration of this demon in, in, in the true angel of victory and of God's grace. Um, but it, this was concretely connected, in fact, with, with an incredibly intense, as we've seen, imperial expansionistic mentality and so also the consumption of these women was, was quite currently part of the of the actual deal. Um, so all extravagant things, um, which perhaps proceed also from misunderstandings of lic licentious poems. Actually, the same Aquitanian nobility was much more, let's say, morally rigid than than we think. Um, and uh, of course, the, the 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 archetypal divide with the north is sort of stereotypical to, to some extent. Um, in any case, um, uh, William surely um, uh, produced this such licentious poems. Um, he left uh, as some, some example of this. Um, William was the first troubadour whose poems survived. This is the um, also the, the elite meaning of this all, that this is not just, again, a minstrel of some sort, uh, and again, the the usual idea of, again, the, the, the servant that quite, you know, in, in a communistic, revolutionistic sense is, is actually smarter than the evil tyrant and whatever, and this, that's the meme of that the fourth estate is like, but it was actually quite much the other way around. Here, we're talking about some of the most, again, virally, patriarchally, um, and again, imperially powerful uh, lords in in the entire Europe at at the time, um, incarnating properly that that highest level of of discipline and and violence and order and that we have described also in many that is about if you can in the medieval violence playlist and the, the, its irrational order, 
right now, you know, if you wonder how even such great power was at some point concentrated, right? Then you have William the Tent, William the Ninth's son, um, also having uh, quite a quite an existence, right? He was born in Toulouse in 1099. He died in 1137. He succeeded his father. Um, also, he took over the Onis by any force. Uh, during the schism of 1130, he joined the party of Anacletus II until St. Bernard of Clairvaux did not bring him back to the obedience of Innocent II in 1135. And yet the following year, he attacked Normandy. He died while going on a pilgrimage to um, St. James, Santiago de Compostela. And that gives you, again, the, the idea of this pilgrimage, this, say, the pilgrimage experience that the military expedition um, as a spiritual and existential journey, just as much as the one of the crusade, but the one of the artistic exploit, right? It's, it's not a... Think about Tannhäuser. Uh, think about uh, like all the symbols of the, of course, Lohengrin, for example, um, the the Knight of the Swan. This you know world that is in in its uh, limitations really illusory. And everything we do is for elevating ourselves. And if you spiritually and transcend this reality, and, and if you look at these people's lifestyles, you realize the just the enterprise, the force, the load. Just think of how psychologically these people were, how, say, self-actualizing, how much will to power they would retain in their hearts. Um, William the Tent was the patron of the brilliant troubadour Marc Abreu. Um, Eleanor of Aquitaine was the granddaughter of William the Ninth as well as the daughter of William the Tenth. Right, so that's the blood she she came from, right? And Eleanor was definitely the greatest supporter of poets in her family. Right? She sort of collected uh, such uh, in fact inheritance that is the same one that she brought um first to Louis the seventh, then to Henry the second. She had a couple of children with the French king, but it's with the Angevin English one that, as you know, she would um, procreate like a very large amount. Um, and all people, again, of the finest blood that would become, in fact, uh, uh, rulers, uh, queens, right, um, all over Europe. And Eleanor transmitted this passion for um, for the Turbar to uh, her offspring. Of course, there was a lot going on just um, around Aquitaine or France or, or England, but surely she was the, coming from the country that was most representative of this whole. I mean, the, the Provencal uh, literature, poetry, music was really spreading everywhere, right? Um, in Sicily, in Italy, in uh, further, in, in, again, as we've seen, these surroundings. And it would nest, in fact, in devil further other currents in European literature, that some, out of which some of the greatest uh, authors uh, emerged from, right? Not just from the Trubar clues, but its evolution as well. So among the many poems which seem to have um, had some connection with Eleanor of Aquitaine and her court, we find Wace's Roman de Brut in 1155, 15,000 verses long, right? insane. This would be essentially re elaborated for the first time, but in fact more famous um, uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britannia. Uh, into, in fact, into vernacular, as a matter of fact. Um, then you have Wace's Chronique de Duc de Normandie, Benoit de saint maur Roman de Troyes. Uh, uh, so this is, these are, again, uh, Arthurian but Trojan cycles as well. Then you have the 
um, also the, the chanson de geste, but it's important to stress how also companies radiate the sort of where we talked about, for example, the sort of viewpoint of the uh, say of, of the English Scottish rivalry, for example, having uh, had to do with um, the English descending from from the Trojans, allegedly the Normans doing so. And, and the Scots naturally at that point having to instead descend from, from the Achaeans because, you know, that was sort of the, the, the right nature, even actually the, the more victorious one of all, even though the Trojans would have allegedly generated the Romans. And again, this is all how they blend this thing. But again, in the video about the Chanson de Geste, I sort of explain in part how they were thinking about this. I will have, of course, uh, on a channel mostly based on medieval history come and and beliefs and identities as I try make to make these videos about um, on on the same topic. You have Gérard de Roussillon composite uh, both old French and Occitan lyrics, so both in Languedoc and Languedoc. Uh, Philippe de Tant Bestiaire. I used to make. Uh, sort of animal symbolism videos on Schwerpunkt that will have to come back with those because they are really really powerful as far as this um, tradition um, traditional symbolism is, is concerned so we can say that um, the literary achievement of Eleanor's courts and I say courts because naturally there were multiple ones involved uh, still like sovereigns were quite itinerating the Anjouan Empire uh, with Eleanor's marriage to, to Henry II of England was just like insanely large um, and you have there in fact all the various elements you have the Britonic cycle you have Bretagne included in this you have the, the Troubar Clues you have the Arturian legions in the north you have the Chanson de Jeuse from the French the, the, the French elements, it's really a lot of stuff plus all the classical um, and also Christian episode that's really that's really stimulating these guys' I imaginations. Um, it, it's all about the absolutes, about the archetypes again. Um, and as a consequence, especially uh, Eleanor and Henry's uh, fertility, brought their children scattered uh, all over Europe. Uh, creating essentially courts of great literary taste. Henry the Young King was very much into this. Uh, Richard Lionheart, uh, who notoriously composed poetry, he um, wrote in uh, Limousin, the Languedoc, right, and uh, also in French, right. Richard was a patron and a protector of the Trouvère and Troubadour of his uh, entourage. Uh, the Countess uh, Ali of, of, of Blois, um, deeply connected with, in fact, the, the Capetians, the Duchess Mathilda of Saxony, the wife of Henry the Lion, uh, that uh, is also mentioned in the Roland's lead as an encouraging force, um, who, who may have patronized uh, Eilhard von Oberga. Um, it's important to stress that Father Conrad, the author of the Rollins lead, at least the translator uh, of this work, um, had been commissioned the same by the Duke Henry the Lion, um, literally from French to Latin to German. Right in in Middle High German says in transition zungen so an ich it's in the Latin bit wungen dann ich the Tutske gekehrt. Um, so the there was an effort there, a transformative one as well, to adapt these contents, uh, to import them, you see. This was the mid, the second half of the 12th century, it's the moment in which the Germans, for example, will import um, the full-fledged Western Frankish feudalism and chivalric uh, codes in a sort of more, uh, again, formal way. And this goes with the development of, in fact, of, of the, king, uh, the king of Germany. Um, in the process here, it's Henry the Lion, but his cousin Frederick Barbarossa was doing exactly the same. We'll see him involved with these issues now. And um, there was an interesting aspect of this all that even though 
pretty much anybody in Europe recognized that the French were at this point the best knights, this, the courtly culture stemmed from there, the, again, the, it was France was the culturally dominant force. Um, the Chanson de Roland in, in French um, had a markedly, um, let's say, nationalistic uh, nature of the French epic. And uh, uh, Henry the Lion was commissioning this work, like translated into German, because he wanted to glorify his own descent from Charlemagne himself. There was, of course, the gold standard together with Constantine and uh, Otto the um, First, and uh, and so there had to be a transformation, the consciousness and the legitimation of knighthood, um, the demands set forth by contemporary Christianity within the same Welfen and um, Stauffer states uh, that were again needing this increased feudal hierarchy in otherwise very sort of. Uh, uh, autonomously minded country, uh, an elective monarchy, um, was fine. But the French side of the story had a bit to be redimensioned. And the Germans here insert a bit more, especially the Saxons, that, as you know, they're the, the bloody crude uh, ones, right, of the, that have remained a bit more in, the, in their primitive and militarized. Um, of course, everybody was militarized feudally at that point. But uh, that bloodthirsty, we can say, um, background wanted to revive not much the um, again the glory of France that pretty much the Chanson de Roland embodied in a truly national sense but rather focusing on Roland heroic death itself at Roncevaux uh, in 778 stressing the synonymity with martyrdom that's what um, the entire point again the Emphasis on the divine transcendence, the self-sacrifice in holy combat. I made a video about this um, uh, from Arjuna to the Templars, right? That explains, in fact, exactly what still in the 12th century. But I will have to make another video about this, and especially about the Germans, because these were the guys now that were sort of more in between modernity and tradition to, at this point, being actually the strongest power in Europe in the second half of the 12th century, um, militarily speaking, under Frederick Barbarossa, um, to stress this aspect. And in fact, actually, I think that, I mean, especially 13th century German songs are some of the finest, like the ones uh, just to, in the moment in which they paralleled French um, chivalric prowess that themselves, even though the 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 French brand was such a hallmark of of uh, high standards that they still somehow believed that, that the French knights were actually better than them and there is a debate about that because it's interesting to to appreciate this sort of French German competition especially during the yes from the 12th to the 14th century but at least doesn't end there as you know militarily speaking but it's at least at least about knighthood and and chivalry, that, that's it. But just for saying that um, that uh, Eleanor's offspring did bring this in. For example, her daughter Eleanor of Castile, Joanna, Queen of Sicily, and Countess of Toulouse. So all the greatest courts in Europe, right? England, France, the Occitanian ones, Castile, Sicily, Germany, uh like you name them, they all receive uh, this uh, Aquitanian influence straight from the core, from the from the blood and guts. You can argue. Um, so speaking of literary patronage, because this is very relevant, um, as you understood, this was not limited to single like small groups, right? Even though uh, these were elite ones and secluded from the rest of society to an extent. It, as we just witnessed, European royalty was extending this to 
to the entire Western Christendom, right? Kings or emperors, as well as the high officials who wielded power, um, were using poets and other entertainers exactly to sustain the same, right? And uh, rewarding them for that because having a great singer, a great composer, a great writer meant to be uh, more powerful. It, may, it meant to gather more people of quality um, around your court that would have brought more resources, that would have uh, signaled internationally that you were the best. Well, it, they were all competing with one another. This is also how it happened on the battlefield. I mean, in the same countries, the same nationalities were extremely jealous of their own individual nobility or prerogatives and who would charge first and um, even disrupt in the collective discipline that was uh, being with enormous efforts, in fact, enforced by these this greater rulers. So it's just a, a great time of uh, the tournaments of chivalric epics that was sung so beautifully um, um, because it was loved by the same people who practiced this, like right? the truest um, divine love towards holy combat and self-improvement, self-transfiguration. However, as we were pointing out at the beginning, society was also more complex, more um, more stratified, and you couldn't quite, like, these gatherings, this music, these compositions weren't secret or hidden from literally everyone like it was just like a hallmark of status to attend uh, this artist's performance together with the uh, the creme de la creme of of uh, the community but of course uh, there was a reflection of this literature in the lower strata of the population were also satirized of course the um, the just the, the contents of, of, of the same. So at times it was uh, just a vertical divide, meaning that there was, I don't know, some faction who hated, I don't know, say the imperial policy. Um, and uh, if you have read the Reinhard Fuchs, for example, it's, it's an Alsatian poem. It's extremely critical of Frederick Barbarossa's expeditions into Lombardy. Um, and it's actually refined, but there is also a bit more of, again, it's like today, like there is an Apollonian and Dionysian orientatively, and then you have traces of both in both. Um, and but, but generally speaking, there is a derision of authority and uh, criticism of the same, which is also what actually authority should stand up to, and like just prov proving to be successful, and that's actually part of the game. Well, the... The funny example is, among the others, the Ark Poet. Um, this um, name under which one of the greatest Goliardic poets is known, um, coming from the, the Rhine, uh, in the service of a high prelate, perhaps the same Reinald of Dassel that was the arch-chancellor of Frederick Barbarossa since 1161. Um, we know ten poems of his, um, the famous Confessio Golie, Goliath Confession, um, is, uh, is, the, is the principal one in which the typical figure is traced with a jovial, uh, adventurous and skeptical fashion. Um, so going against a bit the unchanged, um, unchangeable authoritarian order that of course the empire was incarnating in a in a catholic universal sense and you know extreme force and and and, and dignity and this guy was instead like uh you know uh, going to taverns gambling um dance um which tested sorely the patience of and generosity of his sponsors the same Frederick Barbarossa and Reinald of Dassel. The guy was famous and appreciated, and again, um, it was important just to protect him, even though his ideas were sort of more revolutionary, naturally, than the ones of the imperial establishment were. 
um, and the guy would complain actually in part that he was not paid enough so it, it was a um, always this sort of like what the hell are we paying him for even but you kind of needed him because he was well liked by a certain part of the of, of the population among the patrons of literature bishops had a prominent role for example william of the white hands who served at one time or another as bishop of among the most important dioceses of France, such as Chartres, but also as Archbishop of Saint and Rheims, the guy was a cardinal, as well as the French regent, right? So people heavily involved in all political matters, actually in what was to emerge, at least in the following centuries, the strongest uh, state in Europe, um, had um, you know had dedicated himself to Walter of Chatillon, Alexandres, right? Had been supporting the author, had been following the work. The same goes for his Historia Ecclesiastica, Peter of Poitiers for the Sententia. And it's important um, the that there is this phrase that exemplifies it. Or saint de ces métiers ne sont Ce ne sont clair au chevalier que aussi bon écouter comme les as n'arrêt pas. This is the aforementioned quote. Um, for like the, this is not stuff from the donkeys. And I would like to reflect on this, looking at the biographies of uh, of these guys individually. I mean, just to to make you understand geographically and intellectually how much they spaced and they ranged. Um, uh, William of the White Hands um, had had been born in 1135 to Thibault II, the Count of Champagne. He made a video about um, the, so it's that level of, as we've seen, high mobility. Um, the um, you know but the, he, he was Bishop of Chartres in 1165. Archbishop of Saint, as we remember, in 1168, legate of Pope Alexander III in England to settle the very conflict between Thomas Becket the King and King Heron II. Right. William was consecrated Archbishop of Rheims in 1176, and in virtue of this, he succeeded in obtaining from his nephew, Saint Philip II Augustus of France, the, the maker of France. Right. Consider that um, William dies. Uh, in Laon on September the 7th, 1202. So we're pretty close to the Fourth Crusade. Um, a dozen years later, you have Bouvines, right? So um, in 1179, you have him winning for from his nephew the perpetual privilege for himself and his successors to consecrate the kings of France. Rem had always had that function, but now... Uh, it was properly formalized, right, in, a, in the alliance with this, the Archdiocese. Uh, William of the White Hands was cardinal of the title of Santa Sabina in Rome in 1179. After 1180, he became the advisor minister in Philip II, and um, displaying in this position a, a great uh, political intelligence. He also was, however, ruthless and intransigent against heretics, as he was fully normal. Like this order, as we've seen expressed by art, um, was reflective of the spirit, and the heretics, of course, had no place in that because of the main reasons I explained in my videos about the Albigensians. When Philip Augustus left for the Third Crusade in 1190, the sovereign entrusted the regency to William and his sister, Alec of, of Champagne, the mother of the king himself. Um, and so we've seen there the, the, the important implications. Uh, in 1193, William took on the responsibility of annul annulling the king's marriage to Ingeborg of Denmark, and this actually triggered the papal protest uh, most fiercely but uh, again the guy was more loyal to to France in that sense than 
than the papacy, or at least that's how he saw surely also the role of France within that uh, universal context, because otherwise, you know, France and the papacy would remain strongly aligned. And when we look at figures like, I said, Walter of Châtillon, this was said a poet, like he was born in Lille, um, really contemporary of, you know, um, uh, of William. He died in Amiens in 1201. He studied in Paris and Rheim, so again the same places. Then he was master in law. He had a canonry in Rheim, the same places of William of the White Hand. Um, and then he would have part of in the uh, cancellery of Henry II, from whom, however, he broke uh, away to get closer to Thomas Becket, uh, and passing as master in uh, Châtillon hence the acquired name. Walter went to Bologna to study canon law uh, and to Rome where he drew material for his satires against the papal courier, as a matter of fact, so you see here that more tonic element. He ultimately, however, had the canonry of Amiens. So again, the same clergy could indulge into this, like his Alexandra, as we mentioned before, was composed between 1178 and 1182. Is a great Latin heroic poem in hexameters. Uh, as many as ten books, right? Um, on the dates, as the name goes, of Alexander the Great, that uh, was much more of a hero than we imagine uh, in the West uh, during the Middle Ages. Um, this work was classically conducted on the basis of the historian um, uh, Quintus Curtius Rufus. It is sort of the brightest attempt at medieval Latin epic, uh, telling the truth, and the Walter's satirical and lyrical poems are also original in rhythmic verses and transmitted in two main collections. Some are about uh, uh, love or others about religion, but the, the most extensive mm, are of a reprehensive nature, such as the Apocalypsis Golia Episcopi against the Ecclesiastics, uh, but we do not know whether it was really Walter, the author of it. Um, his poems had considerable success. Uh, in any case, some were accepted or imitated even in uh, Carmina Burana. Walters composed a uh, Georgic poem as well, a testament to his classical uh, inclination. Um, a large of, um, fragment of, of this work is preserved in an anthology. You have in prose also the Tractatus Contra Judeus, which is an anti-Jewish work. Um, speaking of Peter Comesters instead, uh, we know relatively less he was born perhaps in Troyes uh, around the, say, the beginning of the 12th century. He died in Paris in 1179. He was the dean of the chapter of Troyes from 1145 to 64, then chancellor of the Cathedral School of Paris um, until 69, and the canon regular of Saint Victor. Um, he wrote his um, Sermonis. Uh, of short, ex um, essentially short ex exegetical glosses on the Pauline epistolary. Um, his greatest work, as did we mentioned before, is the one for which he has better known, is the Historia Scholastica, which um, is an attempt to make a great sacred history from the origins of the world to Paul's journey to Rome, right? And in the development, of his plan, he follows the Bible and the Fathers, however, always referring religi religious events chronologically to the events in the history of ancient peoples. The work earned him the title of Magister Historiarum for this reason. It was a great um, historiographical um, researcher, unitly. He's also uh, famous for his Sententia, the Sacramentus, in which he but he, he also discusses the authenticity 
of the allegories in the Old and New Testament. Um, we do not know whether he composed the Liber Qui Dicitur Pancrisis, right, which is a collection of sentences and questions taken from contemporary writers. Um, but uh, he likely wasn't the author of this. He was so famous to be remembered by Dante in the Paradise 12, 134. Then speaking finally of Peter Poitier, this was a theologian mostly, he was born around the 30s of the 12th century, died in Paris in 1205. He was the disciple of Peter Lombard in Paris. He succeeded um, to the aforementioned Peter uh, Comister in 1169 in teaching theology. And he is the author of uh, the aforementioned five books of the sentence written around 1175. Um, he inspired. He was inspired by the example of Peter Lombard, um, especially the last book um, of the Sentence in the Sacramental Doctrine is very important. Um, in 1180, um, Peter of Poitiers was the object of a tax of the same by the same Walter of Saint Victor, um, and. Uh, so you see how actually intertwined all these stories really are, right? Among Peter's works, we also remember the Compendium Historiae uh, in Genealogia Christi, the Allegoria Super Tabernaculum Moises, and the Distinctiones Super Psalterium and Varius um, Serbonis that he composed. Um, so when you look at this, picture, uh, you can't help but realizing how wide, let's say, the literary interests were, but also how much they went straight to the core of the allegorical meaning of the scriptures, how much the, even the historical interest was intertwined with this. So it was a huge effort to make sense of the world for how mankind had turned into, and that this was the you see here we're looking at the episcopal side, the clergy uh, side of the story. Um, compared to the nobleman, there is much less of an impetus or hype, but there is a much greater reflection and general consideration also of the past, right? Not much the direct action, but at least the meditation on the one of, of the past. Uh, and uh, for a purpose that had to be as we've seen before, because the afore, say, as we've seen, literature was essentially um, reserved for the, the clergy as well as for the noblemen, that these went in tandem as far as backing each other in the process, just like the papas in the empire. There, there were different functions that here are well exemplified in between the first and the second estate. Monasteries played a very important role in literature um, production in the 12th century. Um, the 12th was particularly important, uh, perhaps, uh, let's say, more from a quantitative than qualitative point of view, meaning that, I mean, the 11th century had really produced much greater figures. Um, made a video about Peter Damien in the early, let's say, um, Say the 11th century rather is as, as a moment of deeper uh, accomplishment and reflection of monastic power. Um, it, by the 12th century, you have larger congregations. There, there is increased loyalty um, and also greater, let's say, a more readily available response to audiences um, by motivated authors. But overall, right, um, these are, let's say, less important than the great uh, diocesan centers that in a way had also always represented a, in fact, a, a more responsibly loaded um, secular clergy like the, the, the hierarchy of the church proper right we will talk again about monastic literature because it sort of um, differs from the, it's either actually monks are more famous if you want in pop culture because of that but the, the Episcopal works are actually very underestimated 
part of the reason the dynamic we just uh, highlighted is that, as we were saying before, the more delete, um, say, the narrower the circles, right? So greater congregations, etc., could have something within themselves that were also was also appealing, right? And would also produce, in fact, a great deal of even of scientific research um, and more literary production. But the, the idea, again, is that the hierarchy, especially during the 12th century, was really building up an unprecedentedly, um, you know, solid system based, in fact, on the feudal monarchy in these regions that uh, was really sophisticated as much as the literature that it was expressing, like the audience needed to have um, say it was required properly to to know just like the references in the um, in the various uh, say in, in the in the value systems that was expressed by the same works. So it's what I tend to emphasize with my videos that you can't just reduce this to sort of some literary divertissement or technical skill just suspensed in in the in a back room right uh, these guys were both knowing like lay and ecclesiastical alike also because they came pretty much from the same families as we've seen before um, what the role of a knight or a bishop was in society in politics in the ultimate economy of salvation if we can so uh, say right so all these cultural experiences were sort of shared by a uh, soul spirit what the, the imperial catholic tradition was trying essentially to keep standing um, and revive and actually the 12th century is the moment of greatest boom if you want of and tumultuous growth of of the system with this is the great century of the cathedrals even before the 13th right this was the foundational moment the one in which everything seemed to to waver, and that's why the again the way of the left hand, uh, the the fire where the fire of death blazes actually was being run more directly by these individual rulers because they this was the great century of the heresies. Um, you've you've seen how much at stake existed still in terms of the prevalence. I don't know a dynasty or another a kingdom or another. So um, we highlighted it before with the sort of German tendency to, to observe the more, uh, not much the, the national, but the, still the more individually um, spiritual dimension in the, of self-sacrifice in holy combat that was necessary to achieve the greatest um, of all, like sacrificing what you care about the most so that you can truly set yourself free and in, in absolute power. The great divine standard that these guys, I mean, a, a little power called the Holy Roman Empire. You know, if you analyze the actual etymology of all those na all these uh, words, like you will have it laid out in front of you without even needing to 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 doubt or to criticize whatever. Uh, there were dangers. There were uh, that were inherent the same. Um, closeness and narrowness of uh, this elite, right? This is why also that was was at stake at some point. Um, the 12th century was also a century of revolt of anti-elite movements that were all into like the heresies as we've seen them more. Um, there was the issue of chastity of mm, general Morris patrimonial matrimonial issues um, um, many of the poets um, were trying even to rise like uh, sub subtly like it, to if not in direct intimacy but at least oppose all it with the noble women that provided them patronage and the inspiration of love and some of these poets were actual knights so they weren't um, it's a uh, Right, you know, it, it's like um, Lancelot and Geneva. It's it's like the ultimate um, prohibition and temptation that is sort of the 
the greatest fixation also many knights that are legitimately seeking also to to improve their own status by marrying a, a rich widow which uh, was quite a frequent eventuality by the way given that women were um, married uh, very very young usually also 12 13 and men were often very much older than them and so if it hadn't been for the perils of war right age alone would have produced that sort of um, say amount of widows even though it's always worth to point out that women died clamorously uh, easily of labor of childbirth uh, and uh, this was um, uh, like an incredibly frequent eventuality that was immortalized even in the sort of the idealization in fact of the angel-like woman that was one of the very few things just like the moment in which she was being sung uh, that would break uh, like the hearts of these you know, systemic serial killers that medieval knights had the exclusive function of, you know, producing on the, on the battlefield. And um, so it's always um, um, terrible to think about how much the elites were loaded with the entire burden of the entire system um, and uh, how their life was absolutely not easier than the one of a peasant, right? Contrary to again to what you 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 would have liked uh, to have believed, because this sort of relieves you from largely not likely not being in a part of the elite yourself. But actually, that's not a positive thing at all. Um, in any case, um, there was really a lot going on behind this literature. Um, to protect the women, for example, from these advan unwanted advances that were incredibly rigid um, dynastic policies that were all one with, again, the survival of these um, principalities, etc. So, um, at some point, the same Occitan poets that were renowned, in fact, for, you know, the, the, also their loving um, uh, tricks and Therefore, they they, may, they they knew at least how to find uh, a counter to, to the same. Wrote of their loves employing a system of code names, the senals, in fact, to designate the supposed objects of their affections, substituting for their real names such phrases as Belle Paradise, Finjoie, um, Mon Désir, and Midon, which is all a generic way of idealizing a specific woman or as we've seen the principle laid behind there was at the same time at, at the same time the same soul um, the female element to tame in in the world and in uh, within uh, themselves uh, to to achieve eventually the apparently unachievable all right but this is also the reason why um, for example, there were some idealized women, some of which were actually you know, existing, that some men, even when they were married, would keep writing about um, because they were so unreachable in a sense that they represented that necessary gap between the absolute and the real. Um, that they should strive for, that would manifest in reality with the beauty of, of these uh, women, but that was in fact more of an ideal than, than else. I mean, this is very famous in literature in general. Think about Beatrice for, for Dante, right, or uh, Laura for, for Petrarch, right? These guys had... Uh, Petrarch was not married, but I mean, both him and Dante had multiple women uh, children so uh, they not with those um, angel-like creatures so to some extent uh, this would even be a rhetorical expedient but it had started from 
especially that fiercely competitive knightly world in which uh like just for marrying uh one of these girls you you could actually have i mean inherit enormous fortunes and being in a immediately in a, in a much bigger game than you had ever thought of um so pretty serious matters we've seen just how the same courtly uh, fashion proceeded from occitania exactly around the Harris to the to the Duchy of Aquitaine, one of the most powerful uh, polities in Europe um, in the first place. Um, so mm, there is, say, from a strictly literary point of view, uh, a set of, an interesting, of interesting questions, such as, for example, how free were the poets um, in composing uh, their works, like speaking of topics, themes, and especially in terms of romances, right? Um, how sincere were they? These uh, how, uh, how say allegorical and how real were they? Right? Who were they actually thinking about when describing those uh, heavenly women, the heavenly maiden? As a matter of fact, this was the one from since ever, like since the the the, 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 the primitive ancestral warriors of of the Indo-European steppe, the heavenly woman had always constituted the prize and the medium to, to heaven as just as a prey of war and so here actually the, still in the history of civilization the, the concept, let's say the proximity to that was much closer uh, to that than to today's view at least the tier view of this absolute degenerated feministic view of the, of the woman that is practically been denied as such and by of course the, the will of marxism to destroy humanity entirely and um, so it's um um well, it's an interesting question because very often we can't sort of understand it we see many styles uh, and not many explanations and when that happens usually it's because Actually, people knew tacitly what this whole thing was about. There were some sort of exoteric occult um, uh, currents within this as well. I mean, there were certain things, for example, that the church would not allow to just say out loud, even though they knew it. They knew it themselves pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, Meister Eckert uh, tells us clearly that there was such initiation even within again the, the 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 clerical ranks about this topics this millinery knowledge and if anything like that's a topic that we have to discuss because the church wasn't really was discouraging that but not the ultimate principle that lay behind that it's a matter like the the christian paradigm shift in um in the first centuries of the um first millennium CE is actually in itself just a powerful statement in terms of look you you had to embody both lay and um, say all power the lay and uh, what would become ecclesiastical and you failed so you must reconsider what your values were and that's essentially what Christianity does at this point that's the reason why these ideas were sort of mitigated at least um, and um, and instead, among the laymen that, as we observed, did not really write, um, also in, very often with languages that, that could be brought at the same level of Latin in literary development, for example, for the topics, etc., but that the, the also largely were illiterate, but still composing vocally, for example. Like, we do not really know like this is like uh, one of the greatest, um, you know, um, terrible things that about history that uh, they knew so much, but they didn't even like the world revolved around these ideas in a way that they didn't even need to explain them to you. It is true that they had partly forgotten them in their primal meanings, but the way they lived, like a, a knight lived uh, in the 12th and 13th century, was just, you know carried out was was enacted in, in the same ways that had always been needed from from millennia in that role uh, from a military point of view at least there is no doubt about this so 
again I'm not going to discuss this but at some point we will have to um, without mentioning that there was a, and this is especially evident in the second half of the 12th century a need for discipline by the same patrons, the same masters, the same superiors other knights, noblemen, etc. that uh, required you to be loyal faithful that's why there is this great contrast between again um, uh, like being a hyper loaded uh, masculine type training and, and constantly from a physical point of view killing people being so creative whatever but at the same time promising to be chased for example what does that mean it's, it's a mean of discipline it's it's part of the actual training um, and it has to do with also the reward like say if you are my best knight I will give you my daughter well that's quite of a deal right and that's why you would like to in fact temper yourself in that fashion um, it was a fierce competition for for the woman of course um, tournaments were basically the, the same and they were uh, aside from the technical reasons for which they needed to keep fit in a in a technical teaching also other the youth etc they uh, they arranged political stuff there they they had to win again the heart of, of the beloved they had you know all the things you know from romance courtly literature and all this stuff and again today's video is not about that but it's important of course to refer to it um, in tournaments that were there was all a deep sexual uh, symbolism uh, revolving around of course the woman's choice in the um, election let's say of, of the of the fittest morally and physical in any case um, the reward was the decoy right um, there are other cultural events like um, uh, like uh, like sometimes it was a reaction to this like the necessity as we were seeing before of creating a world upside down the chthonic element rebelling to the strict rules the discipline the, the rigor etc and so indulging into some you know different forms of belief that were upside down but that also again embodied a bit the the way of the left hand the necessity of indulging to the Dionysian in order to know how to handle that because there can't be any Apollonian or Dionysian without one another in the first place so uh, even financing the festivals or these things happen or you know it was a mean of political promotion or statement or whatever um, the product that the the amount of written literature is relevant. For example, the Saint William the Ninth, that as we've seen was born in the 11th century, had registers um, in writing for different listeners, which, um, like, um, was a way for the poet to choose, right? And this um, amount of of written registers already in the first years of William's reign shows you um, like we are at the beginning of the 12th century so pretty even even early like tells you how already at the time uh, the, especially the vernacular literary tradition was s strong um, especially of course in a country like southern France Occitania it was very very romanized urbanized people were generally speaking more literate that there was a um, more evenly distributed wealth uh, even though it was still essentially a feudal country but there was some communal strength as well so that alone tells you how differentiated articulated the the written dimension the necessity of listing this information of developing uh, literature further from not just some 
oral tradition, but properly uh, one you could distribute technically, precisely, etc. This all speaks of uh, an incredibly uh, complex, articulated culture that had already been expressed in these thoughts, these ideas to a, to a degree that uh, I always say it, the more you study Western history, the more you realize how actually advanced it really, really the, the West was compared to what it's usually said about the, you know, the the Arab, the Byzantine culture. It's that these peoples evidently were already quite ahead in ways that, um, especially when it got down to the distribution of of the elite, the, it, it's creativity, it's prolific um, um, expression of these ideas, but parallels the demographic or the agricultural one. It, it's all one with this uh, true spiritual revival coming from the oldest values of the universal tradition that can never be eliminated when realizing what this literature was actually all about, also in a political and social function, not just an artistic one. Well, again, we will talk about the stuff at some other point more, uh, more in detail. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, um, just leave a like, subscribe to my channel. Um, as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.